Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Senior English B. We are in page, uh, in your hymnal in pages uh, 1120, 1121. This is now the introduction to Unit 6. Uh, the dates are 1901 to the present, and they will give the, the heading, A Time of Rapid Change, the Modern and Postmodern Periods. This is a difficult kind of title because it's really hard to talk about uh, the 20th century and now the 21st century and to really kind of give it any kind of title. So for a long time the 20th century was called the modern era and then what are you going to do after the modern era? Well we call that the postmodern era and of course what are you going to call after the postmodern era? Believe it or not the time we're now living in giving this lecture in the summer of 2017 they often will refer to as the post postmodern. Of course you can see the irony of that one. Well what are we going to do after this? You know, it just goes on, right? I'm sure there will be other titles that come up. By the way, you have a Doris Lessing quote on page 1121 that somehow tries to qualify this time period. Yesterday we split the atom and because of this the great dream and the great nightmare of centuries of human thought have taken flesh and walk beside us all day and night. Doris Lessing's The Small Personal Voice. Uh, let's turn now in your hymnal as is all, always the case, well, all we're doing now again, just like before, we're just taking notes at level one, summarizing what we read. We'll start with this snapshot of the period, a ride on the London Eye. Read it with me, 1122. England celebrated the new millennium with the London Eye, a 443-foot Ferris wheel beside the Thames. You have a picture of it there on the effacing page. Picture this wheel as the symbol of a 2,000-year cycle in time. Looking out from it, we might view England's history, waves of invaders from the Romans to the Normans, performances of Shakespeare's globe, the changing visions of, uh, changing versions of a London known to Dr. Johnson, Charles Dickens, Virginia Woolf. From the top, we might see how England's empire stretched across the globe in the 19th century and how in the 20th, two world wars led to the loss of that empire. The ride over, we would step onto the soil of 21st century England once more a nation rather than an empire. It's a nation, however, whose language is spoken across the globe and whose literature is enriched by writers from everywhere from London to Singapore. Notice your British Empire map at 1900 and all the red, and notice that all the red is gone. Do you see this? So obviously Britain has changed, right? Uh, on 1123, notice that you've got, um, as this London Eye timeline indicates, the, uh, the end of the British Empire was also marked by a renewal of English literature as writers from former colonies made and are still making important contributions to the tradition. During what post-war decade did Britain lose most of its colonies? You'll have to study this. What are the three former colonies that have produced Nobel Prize winning poets who write in English? Okay. All right, let's turn now. We're going to 1124, as is always the case. We're in Unit 6 now. We'll get some historical background, the modern and postmodern periods. Again, your date's 1901 to the present. Let's read. At dusk on August 3rd, 1914, Sir Edwin Gray, the British Foreign Security uh, Secretary, clutching the telegram announcing the German invasion of Belgium, walked to the window, looked over at darkening Europe, and said, quote, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime, end quote. The next day, Britain declared war on Germany. As is always the case when we read this history stuff, it's hard to be able to kind of get our minds into the sense of that historical period. But of all of the units that we've read, Unit 6 will obviously be the most, probably I would say, easiest, for us to kind of get into it because it's so close to our own time. Let's analyze. Notice your first heading on 1124, World War I and its long-lasting effects. Many said that the war would be brief with the troops coming home by Christmas. Instead, the war lasted four long years and 750,000 British soldiers never came home at all. Do some quick mathematics if you need that, if you need that number uh, explained to you. You live in a town of 5,000 people. Divide 750,000 into, into 5,000 and know the number of Warlands that died in that four-year war. World War I and the flaws in the treaty 
with which it was finally settled influenced much of what followed in the 20th century. Germany, for example, wanting to get Russia out of the war and thereby win a victory on the Western Front, transported Lenin to St. Petersburg. There, he led the Bolshevik Revolution that altered the course of Russian and European history. The war also encouraged Irish nationalists to fight for independence in 1916 while the British Army was engaged in France. Their attempted rebellion failed and deepened the hatred between the British and Irish. In 1922, the Irish achieved a measure of independence in the South, but fighting between Catholics and Protestants in the northern British providences prolonged the bloodshed for the rest of the century. The Treaty of Versailles, which settled World War I, led to economic collapse and near anarchy in Germany, paving the way for Hitler to exact revenge on the Allies. The horrific slaughter of the war and the crippling effects of the Great Depression forced England into a passive role in the 1930s. Once the mightiest nation in the world, England looked on as a rearmed Germany, a mass territory in Europe, and as Japan, perceiving Western powers as weak, occupied much of China. The top of 1125. Next heading, World War II and the loss of the empire. The aggression of Germany and Japan led inevitably to World War II. When Hitler's armies overran Europe, the English stood defiantly alone, shielded by the English Channel and the Royal Air Force. It was Winston Churchill who said, their finest hour, quote unquote. In 1942, Russia blunted the German advance, America was in the war, and the tide turned against the aggressors. After nearly six years of struggle, England emerged from the war victorious, battered, and impoverished. England's former colonies became independent countries. The Indian subcontinent, where Gandhi had led an independence movement, was divided into the nations of India and Pakistan in 1947. The Imperial British Lion gave a dying gasp, and in 1956, when Britain, France, and Israel invaded Egypt to keep control of the Suez Canal. However, the United States intervened, the Egyptians kept the canal, and British troops came home to a country ashamed of its government's actions. Suez was forgotten in the cultural upheaval of the 1960s when British fashion and British rock musicians carried the flag around the world in a kind of cultural conquest. Also, writers from England's former colonies were engaged in their own reconquest, enriching English literature. As the century closed, the violence in Northern Ireland seemed to be ending. Also, England pondered its involvement with Europe, not accepting the common currency, the euro, but cooperating in, dr in drilling a tunnel under the English uh, channel. Do Sir Edward Gray's words still have a prophetic ring? Many thought the lamps came on again when the Berlin Wall fell. However, countries cobbled together in the aftermath of World War I, Yugoslavia and Iraq, have been the sites of bitter conflict. Note your uh, final heading here on page 1920, or on page 1125, key historical theme, conflicts and the loss of empire. England emerged victorious but weakened from World War I, which influenced events in Europe for years to come. England was on the winning side in World War II as well, but it was fur weakened further and gradually lost all its colonies. All right, let's turn to 1126. As you know from earlier unit studies, we have essential questions across time that we'll, uh, we'll want to address. Again, note your dates, 1901 to present, a time of rapid change. First question, what is the relationship between literature and place? England in the 20th century is, of course, a geographic place, right? An island nation ravaged and rebuilt to an unprecedented degree. It's also a geopolitical place, a mother country that stood as a land of hope and glory to many citizens of her far-flung empire. Lastly, it's a place of imagination, a realm of letters and literature fed by the ever-changing English language. Look at the next heading. Question. In what ways are the three Englands reflected in literature? The land itself. First heading. The English landscape was untouched by the terrible destruction of World War I. However, the real devastation was human as an entire nation, generation of young men was wiped out, and we should say women as well. The physical and psychological damage of the war is documented in poems by soldier poets. Next heading, post-war growth and materialism. The most obvious change in the landscape after the war came with the automobile. More people could afford cars and ribbons of highway covered the landscape. Accompanying this economic growth was a materialistic attitude on the part of many, perhaps inspired by the war's devastation. 
in his story, The Rocking Horse Winter, 1926. D.H. Lawrence criticizes such materialism and reveals a stylish home as a place haunted by the need for more money, quote unquote. World War II and the Blitz. By the way, just for a second, do note on 1126, you've got essential vocabulary there, questions. Make sure that you know those words. World War II and the Blitz. The Blitz, from the German Blitzkrieg, lightning warfare, refers to the German bombing of English cities during World War II. Large sections of London were destroyed by bombs and rockets, but nothing could break what a song hailed as London Pride. Elizabeth Bowen's story, The Demon Lover, reflects not so much the actual damage as the psychological aftershocks of this assault. Her wartime London is truly a haunted place. On 1127, continue now with me. From the ashes, a new London emerged. Other changes were more problematic. The mill and mining country of the north was no longer the economic heart of the country. Wealth concentrated in the south as banking and technology took command. The economic divide between the rusting north and the booming south grew wider as the century ended. The poet Ted Hughes, a northerner, portrays in his work a vision of nature as both glorious and cruel. That vision may be related to the north-south divide. The next heading, the England of hope and glory. In addition to an economic divide, Britain felt the effects of racial and colonial divisions. In V.S. Nepal's story, B. Wordsworth, well, Wordsworth England is the distant land of hope and glory to those living in colonial Trinidad, but the dream may be an empty one. Until 1950, the typical English man or woman was seen as fair-headed, blue-eyed, and Anglican. When people of color, British citizens from the former colonies, began to move to England, the English had to deal with unprecedented diversity. In Midsummer uh, poem of 2023, Caribbean poet Derek Walcott writes about riots prompted by racial prejudice. Next heading, the realm of the English language. Walcott also raises questions about the English language itself. To whom does the language and its literary tradition belong? Can writers from former colonies and elsewhere in the world find a home in that language and tradition? The evidence starting with Walcott's own brilliant work indicates that the answer is yes. Let's pause for a moment on 1127 and read the British tradition close up on history Planned Town, Unplanned Poet, there on page 1127. Sir Ebenezer Howard, note your dates, 1850 to, 18, uh, to 1928, was a British social thinker who helped invent the concept of the suburbs. In Garden Cities of Tomorrow, 1902, Howard described a new kind of planned town surrounded by, surrounded by a ring of farmland. This garden city, as he called it, would combine the advantages of a city with those of the country. Wellblin Garden City, one of the first examples, was built after World War I and inspired the new towns that the British government built after World War II. Howard's ideas also inspired Walt Disney's original design of the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, Epcot, in Florida. Unplanned by Howard was the fact that Glenn Maxwell's, Maxwell, a talented young poet and playwright, would grow up in a planned town. Humorously calling himself the Shakespeare of Wellwyn Garden City, Maxwell often alludes to Wellwyn in his poetry. He has also been known to stage what he calls large pageant-like shows in his parents' garden. Given Maxwell's skilled use of poetic forms, perhaps it is true that Sir Ebenezer's talent for planning influenced him after all. Okay, let's go to 1128. The next question, how does literature shape or reflect society? First question, in what ways did literature reflect new social freedoms? First heading, women as bicyclists. At the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, the craze for cycling swept England and the continent. Cycling required a drastic change in the way women dressed. The new freedom in clothing was, however, only a part of the change in pre-World War I England. The strongest social movement of the time was the campaign for women's right to vote. The suffragists, women who crusaded for the vote, chained themselves to buildings and went on hunger strikes when arrested. Their victory was slow in coming, but by 1918, women over the age of 30 could vote. Next heading, women as writers. The work of novelist Virginia Woolf revealed a new freedom that women were finding in literature as well. 
Woolf's experimental fiction broke new ground and her nonfiction explored the social conditions that would help women succeed in the arts. The bicycle as product and the right to vote as principle were part of the century-long process of loosening the rigid rules of class, propriety, and morality that had bound the Victorians. This process applied to such areas as access to higher education, health care, marriage laws, and customs for ordinary people in the monarchy, home ownership, pensions, and working conditions. The next question, how did writers respond to social crises? First headed, war and social change. The War of 1914 put most questions of social change on hold, but the men who were demobbed, demobilization or discharged, and the women who had coped without them were not going to settle for the old ways. As soldier poet Siegfried Sasson wrote on one, uh, of, of one patrol, night's misery is ended. However, the years-long misery of the war would not be forgotten by those who returned. The aristocracy, top of 1129, would have to make do with many fewer servants as men and women found work in new industries, automotive, new jobs, radio, and new forms of entertainment, movies. Higher hemlines and shorter hair signaled that women were freer than ever. Next heading, writers and politics. Then came the 1930s, called by poet W.H. Auden, quote, a low, dishonest decade, end quote. Auden and fellow poets Louis McNeese and Stephen Spender responded to the, such crises as the Great Depression and the Spanish Civil War. In that conflict, the communist and fascist tyrannies sparred foreshadowing the conflict that would come in World War II. Especially shocking was the Nazi-Soviet Treaty, a cynical pretense at peace by the totalitarian powers. Men and women on the left and right were sickened by the callousness of it. Left-wing writer George Orwell, who fought in Spain, would later attack totalitarianism of all kinds in books like Animal Farm in the novel 1984. Next heading, speeches and poems. When war broke out, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill rallied the people for the supreme effort required of them. His radio broadcasts and other speeches, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, were classics of their kind. The war ended, the war indeed brought blood and tears, and the bombs and rockets made all the British combatants and casualties. Literary descendants of the world of World War I, soldier poets, writers like Keith Douglas and Elune Lewis recorded the cost of conflict. Let's turn uh, on page 1129 quickly to the British tradition box, The Changing English Language by Richard Lerner. Uh, Brits speak A to Z. At the end of World War II, Winston Churchill tells us the Allied leaders nearly came to blows over a single word during the negotiations when some diplomats suggested that it was time to table an important motion. For the British, table meant that the motion should be put on the table for discussion. For the Americans, it meant just the opposite, that it should be put on the shelf and dismissed from discussion. This confusion serves to illustrate the truth of George Bernard Shaw's pronouncement that, quote, England and America are two countries divided by a common language, end quote. When an American exclaims, I'm mad about my flat, he's upset about his tire. When a Brit exclaims, I'm mad about my flat, she's not bemoaning the puncture of her tire, she is delighted with her apartment. When a Brit points out that you have a ladder in your hose, this, the situation is not as bizarre as you might at first think. Quite simply, you have a run in your stocking. When the, with the increasing influence of film, radio, television, and international travel, the two main streams of English language are rapidly converging like the streets of a circus, British for traffic circle. Nonetheless, there are scores of words, phrases, and spellings about which Brits and Yanks still do not agree. For example, you can look up the spelling of the word color in American and British English if you're interested. Okay, the top of page 1130. As soon as the war had ended, however, Churchill was voted out of office and the returning veterans of the survivors of the bombings demanded a new kind of welfare state. Recovery was slow and England was struggling when the 25-year-old Elizabeth became queen in 1952. She reminded many of Victoria, another shy young woman who had become queen more than a century before, and suddenly things looked brighter. Next major heading question, how did music and literature respond to social changes? First heading, musical and, music and literature in the 60s. 
Things were at their brightest in the next decade, the swinging 60s. The Greek philosopher Plato once said, quote, when the modes of music change, the walls of the city are shaken, end quote. The walls were rocked by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Not as famous as the songwriters and singers, poets like Ted Hughes and Peter Redgrove, nevertheless, opened their minds and their styles to a wider range of new influences. The pendulum slowed in the 80s. Margaret Thatcher, a conservative party member and the first female prime minister, reversed many of the socioeconomic changes of the previous 25 years. Early in her administration, the Army and Navy crushed Argentina's attempt to seize the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. This was the final flick of the imperial lion's tail. She was succeeded by fellow conservative John Major, but the Labor Party came back in power with Tony Blair's election in 1997. Next heading, literature celebrates diversity. More capitalistic, more technological, and much more multicultural, multiracial, the England of Tony Blair entered the 21st century in style. That style was maintained in literature as well, as Zadie Smith's acclaimed first novel, White Teeth, 2000, proclaimed the new millennium with comic celebration of diversity. Notice the, um, the vocabulary words on 1130. Prepare for the exam with those words. Let's jump to 1131. Next question. What is the relationship of the writer to tradition? In the 20th century, the English literary tradition became more accessible and more inclusive. It was more accessible because inexpensive editions of books on the internet made all of English literature instantly available for writers and readers. It was more inclusive because writers from the former colonies were now enriching the tradition. First question, how did writers connect with and renew traditions? First heading, poet as prophet. It was an outsider, for example, who, following the examples of Romantic poets Blake and Shelley, continued the tradition of prophetic poetry. Irish poet William Butler Yeats summed up the fear.